Good morning. I think we'll get started. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lucy Brown. I'm the Deputy Director of the Florence Nightingale Academy, and I have one of the best parts of my job is hosting a webinar series where we have our wonderful speakers that come to share their expertise and knowledge. And today, today's a bit of a special occasion, actually. Um, as, as many of you know, we run the Nightingale Frontline Programme, and we've got three of our wonderful facilitators. Um, now, we have uh, fortnightly debrief sessions to talk about um, the Nightingale Frontline and the themes that are coming through and to support one another um, as facilitators. And our, we had a, I think it was just before Christmas, we had a debrief session and talked about how could we share what we're learning more broadly with a wider audience from the sessions and obviously maintaining confidentiality. And Marie, Fiona and Joe, and um, we, we came up with the idea of hosting a webinar to share those themes with you all. Um, and really it's the key reflections from the Nightingale Frontline sessions. And Marie very um, cleverly came out with the idea of In the Line of Fire, which is the title of our webinar today. So Marie, Fiona and Joe are really experienced nurses, full of expertise. I call them our sages because they always have such wisdom when we, when we catch up. And I'm really, really, um, it's a real privilege to uh, hand across to them shortly to share their findings and reflections on the Nightingale Frontline programme. So just for your um, understanding, we're going to be recording today. So if any of you missed today or want to share it with your colleagues, you can share it later today. It's usually on our YouTube channel in a couple of days time. So please do share with your colleagues. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So if you've got any questions, you can either pop them in the chat box or um, put your hand up or your, your virtual hand or your actual hand and I can um, facilitate the questioning at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand across to uh, Marie. Um, who's going to start um, the presentations and share her findings and reflections um, and then she'll hand across to uh, Jo and Fiona. So over to you guys. Thanks ever so much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Lucy and the team, for inviting us to be part of your webinar series. We're really delighted to be with you today. Um, so the way we've approached this, that uh, over three 15-minute um, sharings. We want to cover some of the broad kind of themes that we felt might be useful and uh, bring a bit of reality about what is the experience of people on the front line? What have we understood and heard from them, particularly over the time of the pandemic? And then some of the strategies and the insights from research and from what we understand from uh, our previous experience can really help both the people who are in the front line and colleagues who are supporting them. So in terms of starting with, without doubt, um, I think we will recognize that redeployment is a big part of our everyday world at the moment. It's not new to nursing. Nursing has always been up for redeployment, helping out on wards, going out to community and things. It's not a new phenomenon and it will be part of our future but never more than it has been over the pandemic and never more so in the terms of having to work rapidly and often wondering what is the impact of that. And this is the one of the things that we'd really like to have as our lens in a way to situate one of the real things that can have a lasting impact on our colleagues and ourselves in order to provide a really safe and supportive service. So in terms of what is it that we know in terms of the, um, the manager, the team leader, this is what we're hearing from them. They dread saying to their staff, we've got to redeploy. They are under pressure to enact that. It's part of the organization requirements and they appreciate the need. Nobody's asking them out of, uh, you know, um, concern to, do, to uh, make their life difficult. It's, a, it's required. They're anxious for their team welfare. How will their team manage in terms of this change? They're worried about continuing their own service. What do they stop doing? What do they hold on to? How do they change the service when they've lost some of their capability? And what time frame are they working to? When will it end? And they genuinely miss their team colleagues. In terms of the, the individual who's going, there are some stories of people who really embrace the opportunity, returning to an area or discovering a new area. But again, I think it is this underlying dread that we hear. Um, and again, they appreciate the need and they understand, you know, that this isn't something that is being asked them lightly, but they are genuinely worried about the move and they're anxious about the new team and the environment in which they're going into. You know, what is expected of them? Will they get on with the new team? And do they feel safe and competent to practice? And something that I personally have heard many times is concern about their PIN. 
this sense of, you know, what are the consequences if I'm not safe and competent to practice? And they too miss their team and the familiarity of their work. And I just put down here a reference that some studies has been done about when staff are redeployed, that we take it very seriously and understand the impact of this on them and consequently then on our services. Just move through. So you're in the situation where you're the manager and you think you're telling a great story of why we're doing it, it's important, you matter. But look at what that person who's receiving it has heard and all the turmoil and the anxiety. And when that anxiety is in play, how does that come out from that person? How is it manifested? Is it anxiety? Is it aggression? Is it somebody who's not been cooperative? You know, you know uh, these are things to try to understand in terms of when we think we are saying what we think it makes sense, how is that being perceived? And to spend some time really getting inside the otherness of the person to understand what it is that we can do to make things different. Without doubt, perception is more important than reality. We can speak a world of rationale and what makes sense, and we know that's the right thing to do. But how is that person perceiving it? And there is something that, uh, in terms of research, the polyvagal theory came out about 2015, it's the work of Porges. And basically, this to me is a, it makes so much sense in terms of us as humans, and particularly as nurses, and indeed our patients. All of us as individuals want to feel safe and connected. If that is in place, we are able to give our best. But if we're not feeling safe or connected, we are in a state of constantly scanning our environment, looking for safety and being very defensive. You, you withdraw to do the minimum in order to make sure that, that you're safe. And certainly in the terms of, of when we are redeployed into a new terrain, a new area, not quite understanding how things are done around here, we will contract and we're not given our best. And that anxiety is very real. And I have heard of managers really worried that when their team, if their team get redeployed again, they may actually leave the organization because of their experiences. So there's something really important about recognizing that and that even though something like redeployment might be necessary, what can we do to really make a difference so therefore it does feel safe and a positive experience? Just want to share with you this amazing work by the Eye Opener Institute called The Happiness at Work. And basically, nothing here will, will, will be new to you, but it reinforces the fact, again, working on the, on the research of Porges, that we need to feel safe. We need to feel psychologically and physically safe in our work environment and to feel that we can trust our team. We need to know that we feel valued and recognized for our work and that the sacrifices that we make when we are redeployed or when you're redeployed and your manager is asking you to do that, they recognize the cost of that and they appreciate that. And ultimately, you can do a good job. Wherever you are, what you do matters. And certainly in the world of nursing, we have this real vocational drive to make a difference. It's one of our core values. And therefore, it, we must speak to that value in order for us to sustain ourselves and really be able to give of our best. So trust in our organization and where we're at, recognition for what we bring and that we go away at the end of the day feeling like we've done a really good job are some of the core components that enable us to be happy at work and therefore to sustain, to, uh, to sustain ourselves. So really looking at what can be different and what we can do to consider this. When you are redeploying somebody, they may very well be going into a new world of work, literally. I have an example of a community team, a respiratory nurse, band six. Yes, an expert in respiratory nursing, but not in IPU work, in, 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 in ward working. So therefore when she was brought across, assuming because she was a band six that she could lead the ward, the question is, is that the best use of her skills? Why not support the band five who knows the organizational flow of the ward to step up into leadership with that band six supporting with her clinical decision making and her expertise at the clinical bedside? So just a couple of things before I hand over to Joe that we can consider as we go forward into this. So you're the new team leader receiving a really important asset to your team. 
you know, they are precious. These people come into your area of work, you know, what do they bring that they, that they can offer you? You know, what's initially, what are their concerns and how are they showing up? Speak to that, make them feel heard. Are you clear about the expectations you have of them? Do they feel safe and skilled to practice at what you're asking of them? And in relation to that, how can you support them to give up their best and to feel part of the team? The more we feel part of the team, the more we show up, the more we can contribute. And therefore that value in their contribution. Clearly debrief is absolutely important to learn. Thank you for coming to work with us. What worked for you? And next time, what could be better? So therefore, as an organizational team, you're growing that sense of, of togetherness, not just a team, but an actual wider team within the organization that understands those needs. And then you as the nurse who is coming on to that new team, how do you find your voice? The need to seek to understand your new team members, you know, be curious about them. What's underneath their reactions and, and their concerns about you coming to join them? Care about the expectations, you know, do you feel safe to practice? And to be able to say, what do you need to give of your best? What do you ask of this? Don't be passive in the sense of, I'm a victim, I'm, you know, I'm a martyr. That's not helping anybody. You are a professional with your critical decision skills, your expertise and your experience, and you're also an employee with rights. So how do you merge the professionalism of being a nurse with your employees to really feel safe in your practice? Absolutely important to negotiate those roles and your role boundaries, to seek clarification about what's not clear, offer suggestions when you're not sure what is understood, and really try to build a real connection for you and your new colleagues. And also remembering that you will go back to your team. So how can you stay connected for people who get you and know what matters to you? and to debrief post-redeployment as well. So you can give back, say, this really worked for me, thank you, but next time, this is what I would, would, would really help me to go forward. And so therefore, what we're doing is that we're growing that improvement of experience, and rather than closing down and saying, never again, we're recognizing that this is part of our world. How can we make it sustainable? And how can we really make it something that is really not as stressful, but actually a supportive and a constructive experience in our workplace? I'm now going to hand over to Joe. Thanks, Marie. So we, we've just heard one of the things that surfaced from the frontline sessions. And another theme that I'm going to focus on is the emotional response which has been experienced and the impact of these emotions on individuals. And on the next slide, we can see that we're, we're all familiar with the current context. We know that COVID has dominated everything for the last two years, and we've all experienced unprecedented challenges, both professionally and personally. But we do know that the nursing and midwifery workforce was significantly under pressure prior to this, and that COVID has just further exposed some of those existing problems, such as staff shortages, stress, absenteeism, and importantly, emotional exhaustion. On the next slide, we can see that there was a publication in 2020 by Professor Mike West and his colleagues called The Courage of Compassion. And that work that they had undertaken outlined ways in which to improve the, the pre-COVID challenges, which I've just mentioned, and ensure that the nursing and midwifery staff well-being, their motivation at work, and their opportunities to minimize that stress were uh, dealt with in that publication. So you can see here the ABC of, of core needs that nurses and midwives require at work. So in terms of autonomy, having that control over your work life and acting with your values. And Marie's tapped into some of this in, in her part of the presentation. Belonging, how important that is to be connected to others, to be cared for and to feel cared for and supported by, by people within a team. And again, the contribution that you need to feel that you are contributing and being effective at work and achieving some outcomes. The difficulty here that were, the, back to the previous slide, thanks, was that the challenges highlighted by the frontline participants 
reported that these three core needs weren't being met because autonomy was reduced due to the command and control approach that was being used in organizations, that belonging was compromised due to issues such as we've heard about redeployment, working in different teams, even wearing PPE where you're masked up, social distancing, and you can't connect and care for people in the same way that you would have done previously. And of course, those folk that were shielding at home and felt that they no longer belonged in a team. We could see the theme coming up in terms of contribution, that nurses and midwives were proud that they'd stepped up to work above and beyond expectations. However, many felt that this had a perception that this wasn't always valued and recognized within the workplace. And so these situations led to participants feeling a range of different emotions. And they're nicely represented on the next slide, which is the, the figures from anybody that, that knows the Inside Out film from 2015 will recognize those figures starting um, at the top right. So we've got sadness, we've got disgust, we've got fear, Mr. Angry there in red and, and joy in the middle. And we know that throughout the last couple of years that there hasn't been much joy talked about it in the workplace. And the predominant emotions that were expressed by the frontline participants really related to anger, sadness, and fear. And they tap into some of the words you can see on the, on the slides. So things like loss of team, loss of confidence, a general sense of loss overall, being scared, scared about COVID for themselves, scared for their families, scared about working in new roles, making mistakes, feeling guilty if they were um, shielding and working at home, uh, the issues we've talked about with regard to redeployment. Um, as well. And also uh, a sense of uh, fear about having enough courage or confidence to manage any difficult conversations that needed to be had, especially for those people in management posts. So basically a whole load of things that relate to being fearful and uncertain, and those things threaten us as humans. And so these emotions translated into a number of behaviours, which we can see on the next slide, particularly in relation to communication. So the little picture on the left, I can really identify with that and the feeling of being overwhelmed by emails, reports, paperwork, and the impact that has on your energy and, and just how it drains you. And it also affects the way, um, the way that you respond. And you can see there on the right that you might have the intention of delivering a message in a certain way, but that's not always the way it's either delivered or it's received. And Marie again referred to that earlier. And so we know that emotions are contagious. We can all sense the mood in a room when you walk into it. And um, we're all very familiar with the, the tone that's set um, on a shift when you go to work and there are certain people working that day and you sort of know how the day is going to go. Um, on the next slide, I don't think that really needs any explanation. Although when I show that to my brother, he, uh, he always thinks that's, uh, that's me and him. <laughs> so how do we manage emotions? On the next slide, you'll see a, a model that I really like uh, the model of emotional regulation by Paul Gilbert. And this model suggests that as human beings, we move between three different systems of threat, drive, and soothe. And you can see threat at the bottom there in red, drive on the left in blue, and the soothe in green on, on the top right. But he also says that as humans, we spend the majority of our time in, in threat. And we could see this um, again reflected in the frontline sessions. And again, Marie's talked about that too, about how we retreat into ourselves when we're, we're under threat. So there were many people that were sort of stuck in threat and they were just um, trying to keep themselves safe. Um, and that's where they spent the majority of their time responding to, to the, co the COVID challenges as well as maybe personal challenges too. Some people moved from, used the threat system to move into the drive system and they worked harder and harder to try and achieve goals and tasks. 
Um, but we were, we were surprised, well not surprised, we recognised that there was very little opportunity for people to move into the green or soothe system during this time. Um, although there was evidence from individuals to say that when they joined a frontline session, it offered them a safe space in which to reflect and pause and slow down and sort of understand themselves and what was happening. And on the next slide, you can see that understanding your own emotions is important um, because you can't tune into other people if you're not tuned into yourself and therefore it makes teamwork very difficult. So the, the next slide shows the emotional intelligence framework by Daniel Goldman. Again, a great, a great framework, um, which I'm not going to go into in detail, except to say that on the top left-hand corner, it, it outlines that self-awareness and understanding your emotions enables you to work on the next quadrant down, which is self-management and being your best self. And we know from the frontline sessions that participants wanted to be at their best as nurses and midwives, both, both personally and professionally, and that the frontline sessions helped them to find some strategies um, to do this. And the next slide shows us some of the repeated themes because there, there were many, many themes and these were, were a number that, that popped up time and time again. Um, that, that people felt actually it was important to share vulnerabilities instead of keeping the things you were worried about tightly inside you, that actually sharing what you were worried about with either a buddy or through a frontline session or supervision sessions, coaching sessions, was very valuable. Um, and that this was an opportunity then to reflect a bit more, moving into the green soothe circle, reflecting on what was happening and understanding any development needs that, that you might have, and actually then being able to ask for help in a confident way. So this, this movement into the sort of green soothe system and taking a bit of time to understand um, your own vulnerabilities and needs meant that people then felt able to, to be more empowered and to take control of situations. And something that did crop up certainly for me in my sessions a lot of the time was that senior staff felt they needed to be available all the time. So they would be contactable at home 24 seven. They would be uh, contactable all hours of the day when they were in work, the office door would be open all the time. Um, and that was something that people were able to work on in terms of being less available at others beck and call by being able to set their own boundaries about when they would be available for conversations. And so this was another learning for people about um, not responding quickly, just learning to breathe, take a breath and then respond instead of that sort of automatic response all the time. So there was evidence there through the sessions that people were able to slow down and move into the green soothe section. And we all need to have um, a mixture of those uh, systems that we work in for emotional regulation. And um, that was very important. And these strategies really resonated with me as things I worked on um, when I was lucky enough to, to be a Florence Nightingale scholar myself. And I struggled with feeling overwhelmed with workload and how that depleted me at a, at a point in, in my career. And on the next slide, you'll see that I managed to synthesize my personal learning into five habits. So a bundle of five habits, because I like the quality improvement work as well and using bundles and that worked for me and have that up on my, on my desk or something that would just remind me to uh, what I needed to focus on in order to feel that I was being at my best. So in terms of number one, being kind to yourself, this wasn't about you know, going and buying yourself a bar of chocolate or having a, an early night or a bubble bath, but this was about developing healthy boundaries uh, and learning when to say no. Um, and, and that's something uh, you know, I'm still working on, 
everybody I think has to work on things constantly in order to practice and, and get them right. Being a role model, this was again about what signals was I sending out. So what, you know, what people see you give meaning and purpose to affects the, the perceptions. And obviously what you give meaning and purpose to is, um, is something that you're focusing on and you want to make sure that it's the right thing that you're focusing on and is aligning with your core values. And being able to reflect both informally and formally very regularly just to continually learn and, and practice what you're doing is very important. And in terms of being productive and not busy, I, I think we can all recognize that we can be very busy and we don't feel that we're achieving a huge amount. So um, for me, that was really, again, about being courageous and also being disciplined and, and managing distractions that pop up, you know, checking your phone every, every time you see a message popping up on the screen and just losing that focus. So it was managing distractions and also learning how to delegate and delegation is an art in itself. And that was actually um, captured a lot during the frontline sessions that, that during COVID people were anxious about delegating to others because other people seemed to be so busy and overwhelmed and under pressure. So people were just doing everything themselves. And really lastly, the, the important point that communication, connection and relationships are what it's all about. And just to remember that we need different conversations to accomplish different things. And that's why you need to step back, just take a, a bit of a break and think about the conversation that you need so that you can be in control of the conversation. And Fiona's going to share with us um, a, a tool that's helpful in having some form of communication. Thanks, and over to Fiona. Okay, you really just bear with me, I'll put the um, presentation up. Can you all see that? Okay. So thanks for that, um, Marie and Jo. Um, what we've seen, uh, what we've been talking about is what we've been seeing in the sessions um, and the impact on this. And as we've been hearing from Marie, the experience of deploying staff generates anxiety for both those deployed and the receiving team. And Marie talked about safety and connection. And Jo's taken this further and she's explored the imperatives of a successful working environment and the drivers of emotional regulation. We've seen that the impact of deployment on leaders and their busy teams can be disruptive and that clear, compassionate but effective communication becomes key for emotional regulation and for the successful work environment. Now clearly some interactions are easier to manage than others and particularly when you're under time pressure and the team are feeling fragmented and a bit emotionally challenged. So the following model um, provides a simple structure for managing interactions with colleagues and considers everyone's needs, including the leader's time and their emotional capacity. So here's a brief outline of um, the model that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's called the brief and boundary model. Um, and it represents a respectful and productive method of problem solving communication that's suitable for short interactions. Uh, we'll examine each stage of the model, including some additional theories that underpin these, although we've not got a lot of time to go into depth in those. Um, it is tried and tested in that I worked with a community trust in Derbyshire some years ago who adopted this model as an accepted structure for all of those ad hoc, have you got a minute type conversations that we all find ourselves having with colleagues. It provides a baseline for the quality of professional conversations that you want to promote and that you expect from each other. So the first aspect of the model is when the practitioner picks up the signal. Um, that a colleague wants to talk. The signal could range from a colleague's body language, 
all the way through to an overt approach for help. So once the signal's noticed by the practitioner, they have a choice. Should they notice or acknowledge the signal? And we often don't think we do have a choice. We think, you know, we have to acknowledge it. But there are some things that we need to think about. All sorts of factors may influence acknowledgement of a signal, such as having enough time for a discussion in that moment. Environmental factors, such as, is this the right place to be having this conversation? Is it a conducive environment? And how the person that's been approached is feeling in themselves. If you're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, perhaps this isn't the right time to be taking on another conversation about somebody else feeling overwhelmed. Whatever the response, we should consider the intention behind our interventions. So I just want to say a bit more about interventions and our intentions. So let me just explain that when I talk about intervention, I mean the way you use communication to respond to an approach or a signal that you've picked up from a colleague. And by intention, I mean, what are you trying to achieve through that intervention? Let me say a bit more. According to Heron, who you may all have heard of, um, professional helping interventions are all either authoritative or facilitative. One type of intervention is neither better or more important than the other. What's useful to think about is what are you trying to achieve with your intervention and the type of approach that's most appropriate to that. So here's um, a drawing of Heron's six category intervention analysis. Heron suggests that there are six types of intervention possible in any communicative intervention. Three facilitative ones, so that's the supportive, cathartic and catalytic, and three authoritative ones, confronting, informative and prescriptive. Now, interestingly, when asked, nurses tend to identify themselves as being more skilled, wait for it, with the authoritative interventions, in particular prescriptive and informative. Although the supportive intervention was the most highly ranked, perhaps the other interventions, so we're talking about cathartic and catalytic, were perceived as more time hungry. You know, you might be opening a can of worms and have you got time to deal with them. Um, the confronting um, intervention is often misunderstood as some sort of aggressive um, calling people out, when in fact it's more about noticing a dissonance between people's what people say they're doing and their behaviour. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look at this in any depth and it should form its own entire webinar. And it could be that many of you know this uh, theory already. Um, we've included the reference on the slide and at the back of the um, presentation. So you can pursue it if you want to know more. The key thing to consider is what you're trying to achieve in your interaction and what interve interventions will help you get there. So to return to the model and thinking about choice, this will be influenced by your time or capacity. But the idea is you should actually make an active choice about whether you're going to make a response. And if you are, how are you going to frame it? So the next thing to think about is time. If you don't have the time or emotional capacity to pursue a signal, think of the most appropriate and sensitive way of handling that. Perhaps you could acknowledge with a touch and or make an offer of time later. Or sometimes just a look acknowledges that you've seen there's an issue. Any offer of time that you do make should be clearly stated and not open-ended. So the offer should be seen as sort of like a mini contract. Both parties should be clear about what is being offered and the parameters of the discussion. Now we're going to move into discussing the actual discussion. The discussion needs to be usefully structured so that you don't both get lost in the narrative. 
um, and there are several different reflective frameworks that can be used. Driscoll's one, Egan is another. I would call them tools, tools that encourage ownership of any decision making by the person that's made the approach and removes the burden of feeling that the problem has been moved from your colleague to you. So the next few slides just mention some of these discussion frameworks. Again, not in any depth, uh, but you have got the references at the end um, that you can follow if you want to do more reading. So first, just to say a word about how the brief and boundary model works. It's designed to work with brief interventions. So to turn what potentially uh, could be long interactions into shorter, but empathetic and productive ones. In nursing, we're often taught communication skills to be used in a context that frequently does not exist. Mechanisms such as coaching or clinical supervision need time and protected space. However, the day-to-day -day clinical reality could be frantic and full of the unexpected. We need to turn to frameworks for structured discussion in the moment that don't need an hour and a do not disturb sign. However, this slide just shows what a lot's going on when we have a professional conversation. Um, I just want to turn your attention to the three blocks in the middle and suggest that any interaction that we have with our colleagues uh, has a beginning, a middle and an end. That makes sense, doesn't it? And what as nurses and health professionals were very good at um, starting conversations <laughs> and quite good at finding stuff out, opening things up. So that middle section is a diamond for a reason. And if you think about the beginning of the middle, we, we're very good at exploring what's going on. What we're not so good at is closing things down in a satisfactory way that somebody doesn't feel brushed off. Um, and also having a constructive ending that has a, an action plan if one's required as a result of it. So we're good at opening these conversations up, not so good at closing them down in, in a satisfactory way and a productive way. Um, one commonly used way to structure um, conversation uh, that you may have heard of is Egan's three stage helping model. Um, again, we haven't got time to look at this in any great depth, but just to remind you that there are three stages to the model. Uh, the first part of it um, examines what the current situation is with somebody. The second starts to think about um, how you could identify a preferred future uh, and explore what options there are for getting there. And the third stage thinks about um, a choice of realistic goals based on the discussions in stage one and two. Transitions such as deployment are difficult and small manageable steps work best towards achieving goals so it's not helpful to make large sweeping statements about how people can make changes. And finally, my absolute favourite way to structure conversation, reflection, planning, my life, everything, is Driscoll's what, so what, now what. Um, again, it's, I'm hopeful that you'll have heard of this before. Um, and the what helps to identify the current situation and provides space to describe the issue or problem. So what provides an analysis of the impact? Why does this matter? And now what considers action planning and further learning? What needs to happen now to move forward? And if you think about today's presentation, that's what we've done. We've examined what the problems are. We've thought about what the impact of that is. Um, and now we're thinking about, well, what's, what are some of the things we could do to address that? It's so easy to remember this. Uh, that's why I like it. And it stops you getting lost in the narrative and ensures discussion is productive. And it's really good for short but meaningful interactions. A top tip is that what nurses are prone to do is to go from the what to the now what. We're very good at um, skipping the analysis bit, 
But unless we actually know what's really going on, what is the impact of the problem that somebody's brought to us, um, how do we know that the solution that we're, we're starting to think about is the right one? So in summary, um, appropriate leader responses ensure urgent issues are dealt with promptly and by the right mechanisms. The interactions should stay within the boundaries that you agreed at the outset um, and close within the time offer that you made. The main usefulness of the model is that it's time limited and it's based on ability or capacity to respond. And it uses a process to structure discussion and gives proper thought to closure, action planning and safety netting. It could easily be used as a telephone discussion or an online support, online support mechanism. So Crawford et al argue that brief, ordinary but structured communication is likely to be less staged, more genuine and add to the emotional warmth of the workplace. If you apply this to team conversations, brief and boundaried interactions promote both, both mutual respect and emotional safety. Thank you. Thanks Fiona, that and Joe and Marie for really interesting presentations and insights. It's really nice to have an oversight of each of the areas and nice to see the themes from the Nightingale um, uh, Frontline Programme kind of coming through to support people's learning further. So there's quite a lot of interest in the chat box asking about questions. So we'll go across to anybody would like to, to, everyone like to turn their cameras on if you can. I know some people have a reduced bandwidth, but if you're able to put your cameras on so we can see you and if you wanted to ask any questions, um, that would be wonderful. Or oh, any comments, reflections? Um, great, lovely to see you all. Maddie, Leona and Celia again, Genevieve, Kirsty, lovely to see you this, after this afternoon now. We've just gone over this afternoon. So any questions, if you wanted to raise your hand or put your, um, your actual hand up or virtual hand or pop something in the chat box if you don't feel confident to ask. Celia, I think you had some reflections, didn't you, in the chat box I saw? They're just saying it's interesting, reinforcing previous learning. Oh, Kirsty, I think Kirsty's popping her hand up. Hi, over to you, Kirsty. Thanks for joining us. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Hey, okay. Um, so I just first wanted to say, I thought um, all of the presentations, although you were kind of taking it from um, kind of different angles and aspects, you can really see everything is so interconnected. Um, everything is playing into um, each element. So I think that's really great just to feed that back. Um, I had um, a bit of a question primarily for Fiona um, around, um, I think it's really interesting that we're talking about communication models in that quick sense, because that's not really something that we're ever kind of um, taught or told of to do. It's always that constructive, collaborative, long model. Um, I wondered if you had any tips and tricks or resources that could be perhaps disseminated pictures disseminated to people that are new to this model, so people that might be used to that more lengthy communication. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Kirsty. Um, I think I could have talked for several hours on, on the material that uh, I, I briefly covered. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the brief and boundary model, it, it, it was of my own design. Um, and sadly, there's nothing that's been written about it. So I can't refer you mm. to an article or anything like that. I think you're probably heading up that I ought to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I guess You should I, publish one. I think she should, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> Very naughty. But um, what, what I would say is that, um, if you just look at the structure of the, the most complicated part of that model really is how you structure discussion. Um, but if we mm. take model in its um, purity, I think it's something anybody could implement. And I guess it's just um, you can start with yourself uh, and just make that good practice that um, that's how you interact with people. They get to know that that's the way you mm. would communicate. If you can influence an entire team, to, to buy into communicating with each other in that way, that is going to reduce the stress um, in a workplace enormously because everybody knows that you can't just launch into your problem, that you've got to be respectful of whether people have got time and capacity. Just makes the workplace mm -hmm. more respectful. But 
I guess, um, I guess it, as it, it, that would be my tip, really. Just uh, don't worry too much about the, the um, complexity of the theories that underpin some of the stuff. The model in itself is actually quite simple and straightforward. Okay, thanks, Kirsty. Thank Can you. I I think Joe's going to add to, add to that as well. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, just, just to add to that, because that was a great uh, comment there, Kirsty. And Fiona's really outlined something that's fantastic to use. I, I mentioned there about understanding what conversation you need to have with somebody. And there is, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there is um, a lot of work done around that. So if you want, uh, there's two types of conversation, a committed conversation where you're asking for something or you want to achieve something, or an uncommitted conversation, which is just like chat. And I think as, yeah. as nurses and midwives, we tend to have that chat in the coffee room. And then sometimes it spills over into the work environment where you're just chatting, but really what you want is something to happen, but you haven't changed your conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of understanding the difference between what, what conversation you need to be having, thinking about it. Thanks, Joe. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kirsty. So, are there Thank questions you. opened up? Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions, Maddie? Maddie's put in the chat box. Really interesting presentation. So, thank you. And I've got a visitor from a professor from a South Korean um, university. He's joined us today, which is exciting. Any questions from anybody else? If there's no questions, I'm happy to jump in just to add to the resources that uh, Fiona and uh, Joe mentioned about Coast Coasty. You may have heard of the Tigro model. It's by John Whitmore, and it is something that um, is really a useful acronym just to structure, again, a conversation which can be five minutes or an hour. And the Tigro, it stands for T, what's the topic? The G stands for what's the goal? What's the outcome of the conversation? The reality, the R stands for reality. What is going on right now that you really uh, are dealing with? Te bring me into your world so I understand what you're worried about. The O stands for options. So what do you think are the options that you see? So about staffing, for example, what do you see are the options for managing that? And the W is for uh, the will, the wrap up. So next steps, so what now? So, you know, you can see how, as, you, as, jo, as Fiona was saying, you know, once people, once you start modeling that kind of approach, uh, your colleagues can, uh, you can do some sessions on it so everybody understands with transparency, this is a type of conversation structure that might just bring people together. People come with their own solutions to be tested rather than coming to get a passive response from the manager because they're the boss as such. So I do find Tigro is a really useful way that you may just want to have in your toolkit. Thanks, Marie, that's really helpful. And we can share some resources on that as well. So we have got a, a question in the- oh. really, Sorry to interrupt. That was really, really helpful, everyone. Thank you for that. Um, part of my role, um, I work on um, preceptorship for newly qualified and registered nurses. Mm -hmm. And we've launched a preceptor coordinator role. And the one thing that staff always feedback they struggle with is feedback and particularly difficult communication. So I think this is all gonna um, really help contribute to their developments that's great, thank you. Oh, thanks, Kirsty. It's really great to hear you can be using that first hand as well. We've got a question from Celia in the chat box. Says, How can we best disseminate the learning from today's session? So I guess maybe a short, short summary from each of you. How can you take this back to the workplace? Joe, are you happy to go first? Sorry, uh, my connection broke up. Can you repeat that? I did it, sorry. So, so how can we best, it's from Celia, so how can we best disseminate the learnings from today's session? So I think Kirsty gave a really good example of taking it back to your, your preceptors um, teams. But Joe, Fiona, yeah. Marie, any wisdom you'd like to share? Well, uh, personally, I, I always like to find something that really resonates with me and something that I've listened to and take that one point away and look at what that means to you and how best you could incorporate that into your personal and, and professional life so that's why I came up with my five habits because I had five things but yeah pick something if you want to work on communication pick that focus on it and work on it great thanks Joe. anything you'd like to add to Fiona or Marie um, just think about it, what you might like to do is invite your colleagues, two or three colleagues to watch, repeat the webinar watch the webinar, mm. that something spoke to you and to 
together because by yourself, you'll dissipate the energy. People won't get where you're coming from. But if there's two or three of you who get something that speaks to your particular context, you've then got something to work on together. So pick three or four colleagues, have a cup of tea, uh, watch it together and see what together you co-design that works for your particular environment. Great advice, Marie. <laughs> we do like tea, don't we? The nurses are some advice. <laughs> Fiona, over, yeah, over to you, I, anything you'd like to share? Um, I, I think what um, Kirsty uh, highlighted the most pertinent point, which is uh, reading and being able to go to a source that kind of um, will enhance and underpin uh, anything that's kind of really rung a, a bell with you today. And hopefully the uh, reference list that we've put at the end should help with that. Um, so I think I think that's what I would suggest. Thanks, Fiona. That's really good. And reflection. I'm a big reflector, so reflection is always key as well. I think when you've when you've learned something, write it down and it stays within you. So I've, I noticed Di's got a hand up. So Di, I know you've got no camera today, but we've got a question for Joe, Fiona, and Marie. It's more of a, a thank you, really. I wasn't quite sure if you would come to me, so I put something similar into the, the chat Oh, there. did you? <laughs> um, so so uh, for those that don't know, I'm the Defence Professor of Nursing, and my real focus is to look at our deployment cycles. So from my perspective, preparedness for, and then more importantly, recovery from. So a lot of what you said today really resonates, and it's quite... I don't know if exciting is the right word to say, but you know that, that lots of it does resonate. Yes, we we are a different organisation, but we all we do it differently is wear a different coloured uniform. So a lot of what you've said absolutely resonates with with our own experiences and and the shared work that we. I will link in with you, ladies, because I think um, having that visual tool. I am quite a visual thinker personally, but to be able to see something. Um, of how you open up these conversations uh, and if there's a reluctance in the workplace because you perceive that everything is too busy and my element isn't that important in the scheme of things and you know you're not being kind to yourself as you described and finding that time and protective space and that organizational legitimized time perhaps to do that people often maybe feel that that isn't significant enough to make that space within that day uh, and patient care delivery far outweighs that, that having that greater need. So um, I think it's it's really important. So primarily thank you um, because you're absolutely uh, eating many of my sandwiches, but it'd be great to link <laughs> in and post the, the webinar. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to connect you. Happy to connect you, Tom. <laughs> thank so you're, you. You're <laughs> um, oh, we've got another, another question in the chat if anyone wants to put their hand up or... Something quick, like really great um, presentation, just really great thanks from everybody, really informative, amazing group of facilitators. I, I concur with that comment. You are definitely a wonderful group. I feel very fortunate to work with you all. Um, I guess if there's no more questions, just, just to summarise, really, I, I think the key key learnings for me is be kind to yourself and reflection. I think that would be curious. Um, but it's great and share your vulnerabilities, I think, is a big thing that I'm going to take away from today. Just, just to remind you all, Nightingale Frontline is open to all of our members, so please do encourage your teams to sign up. This is where you can actually come and have a safe psychological space with these wonderful facilitators, with a whole team of facilitators um, available to support you. So please do sign up if you... If you aren't uh, currently a member from a member organisation, then um, your chief nurses can actually purchase, your senior nurses can purchase um, sessions with us as well. So please do get in contact with us um, at the FNF Academy. Um, that's available to you. We'll share the resources. I, I noticed that the team have already sent out the presentation and the link will be available in a couple of days to YouTube. So I guess the key learning, like Marie said, take it back to your teams, watch it together, watch the errors, digest it all and share that learning because um, it's so important that we support one another um, now more than ever. Um, and thanks for your questions um, and thank you for attending today. Um, it's really great to see the webinar um, series growing in popularity and uh, really we're, we're getting really great reach. So thank you all. Um, so I think if there's no more questions today, um, enjoy your days, have a great Thursday and see you at the next webinar. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.